This weekend, uh, we had the opportunity to be with my mother-in-law in in Arkansas, and due to COVID, uh, we've not been able to see her for over a year. Uh, It was just a real gift for uh, Lisa and I and for our boys and uh, our daughter-in-law to be able to to be with her. Uh, And one of the things that we did, that my wife did, and I was a participant in, uh, was getting a new phone for my mother-in-law, and she keeps it really simple. So she has a flip phone, uh, and we simply got a new flip phone. Now, I don't know the last time you've messed around with a flip phone, but uh, it'll make you uh, think things you wish you weren't thinking uh, when you're trying to move a hundred contacts manually. Uh, And if you remember, uh, we reduced it to 30, uh, so fortunately she was gracious and was willing to let several of them go. Uh, But you can't take a flip phone and get them to transfer the information when you buy a new flip phone. Now, you probably don't know that because most of you aren't dealing with flip phones. Say that one a few times fast. (laughs) With flip phones. Uh, And so we were spending uh, Friday afternoon, we spent uh, some time. uh, And if you remember when you had a flip phone, and most of you had one, that's how you started. uh, And the way you enter a contact, uh, the alphabet is like three or four letters per number, Uh, and you hit the number, uh, and then you have to scroll down on this little thing that thinks it's a scroll button, and it's just little, you barely get your finger on it, Uh, and then you go down to where you choose one of those four letters, uh, or three letters, and then you scroll over and hit your letter, and then you have to hit OK to seal it, otherwise it's going to move once you make a move on the... Uh, on your next letter, uh, and you do this, like, one letter at a time, and I, I relearned that I don't appreciate tedious. I, I am not good uh, at, at tedious. Well, we were having this conversation then with our boys and my, and my daughter-in-law when they arrived, and my sons, who are in their late 20s, all right, keep this in mind. This is how fast everything has moved. Their late 20s, and Barrett starts saying, Yes, that's why the next version, they pu- you pull out a little uh, keyboard from your phone. You remember that? You had a flip phone, and then I guess a Blackberry. I don't know what it was, but whatever the th- next thing was, it was you pull out the little keyboard. Then you don't have to deal with three or four letters per number. You just have your little keyboard that your fingers barely can, can hit. Uh, and then shortly after that, I guess we hit the iPhone world, and, and things are a lot easier uh, today. Which brings us, when we think about our seniors that are moving out today, uh, they are in an, uh, a TikTok, Snapchat, Instagram generation. Uh, and it's stunning to think that my sons, 26 and 28, uh, remember that whole movement uh, of where we were with a flip phone to where we are today. It's a different world, totally different world. Uh, I'd like for us to think about uh, our students that are going off uh, today. Now, you may think, okay, well, this, this message probably isn't for me. It's for our high school seniors. No, this message is for everybody. Anytime we're in the Scripture, there's something for everybody. Uh, and sometimes we can apply it ourselves. God brings things to mind as we read it, study it. Other times we need help. I'm going to focus my application on students And this is how I'd like for you to think. It's possible that you have kids that are younger than seniors in high school. It's possible that you have kids older than seniors in high school. It's also possible that you have grandkids. And part of what I'd like to do this morning, no matter what age kids or grandkids, or you may know somebody that has kids or grandkids, I want to help chart a path from Scripture of what I believe will be a really healthy path for them in a culture that's incredibly difficult to navigate. And I believe there's something for everybody uh, as we think about this pathway. Now, all of us are in different parts of our faith. In Philippians 1.6, it says, I'm confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. God has begun a work in many of us in here. It's possible that work has not begun and you're still in unfaith in Him. But for most who are online or in here, 
God has begun a work, and God is a finisher. He will finish the work that he begins. That's his promise in Philippians 1.6. So each of us in a different place in our faith, God meets us right where we are, and he continues to move us forward in being more and more like him and living for his glory in knowing more and more what that means. Our students, as you saw, will be doing a variety of things. Many of them, if you really took note, are going to Texas A&M. I don't know if you noticed that or not, but I noticed that. Many, not just our seniors, but many, uh, will head off to the military. Some will go to technical schools. Some will go away to school. Some will stay local. A variety of things. Some will head to the workforce. Uh, God has a different design for each. Uh, And each are about to take that path. There will be challenges to each of their minds as there is to ours. And there will be a battle for their soul. Just like there's a battle for yours. How will we best win? How will we best walk in a way that most honors God. Well, I'd like to suggest today, in light of our last conversation in this series, that all of us would do well to be like Thomas. If you'll turn in your Bibles to John chapter 20, we'll be in verses 24 through 29. As you turn to the scripture, if you don't have a Bible, we'll have the verses on the screen, so you'll be able to follow that way. Next week is Mother's Day, and we'll we'll focus in on our moms, and we're looking forward to that time together. Uh, And then we'll start a new series on the minor prophets. There are 12 minor prophets. They're the last 12 books of the Old Testament. Uh, And for the summer, we'd like to take one of those prophets per week, hang out in one passage of Scripture while giving an overview so that all of us might have a fresh understanding of what God has for us in that part of Scripture. Simultaneous to our Sunday mornings in the minor prophets, Eric Estes Uh, on our staff, will be leading us to a study of Revelation uh, on Wednesday nights. And so we're looking forward uh, to the strength of what God has for us uh, in His Word over the course of these next several uh, months. The way I'd like to think about our conversation today, our last conversation, and again we have little two-minute or so snippets of the overview of all the different kinds of conversations Jesus had with people and how we can have conversations in real truth and with grace Uh, This is a conversation about unbelief. How do we have a conversation? If we look at Jesus, how did he have a conversation with one of his own about unbelief? Now, my hunch is all of us have had, or at least the opportunity to have had, a dialogue with somebody, whether directly in our own home, friends in the workplace, wherever it might be, where there is a series of questions of unbelief. It might be that you have those questions today, and I hope you'll find this to be a really safe place to be able to express what your questions are, and then hopefully we can be a help to finding the answers to those questions. So let's think about unbelief. We thought that this would be a fantastic topic and conversation to end on with our students, uh, who will no doubt be challenged Uh, on their campuses and in the places uh, where they're going. I've seen a number of stories, Eric Metaxas included. Uh, Many of you may be familiar with his writings. Phenomenal uh, thinker, Christian thinker uh, in our culture today. Uh, But basically, uh, he was raised in a way that would be to follow God, good core values. Uh, And then in essence, uh, his education was paid for uh, at an Ivy League school to undo Uh, everything that his parents did. Uh, And we need to know that reality moving ahead, that there's a real possibility you're about to pay a lot of money uh, for everything you have taught and you're shaping your child to be for that to be undone. But that doesn't have to happen. It doesn't have to go that way. There's a way to navigate that well and to come out actually stronger 
through these next several years. So when we look at this, I've been trying to break these down in conversational form and how we can learn. And, and the way I would see this in verses 24 and 25 is if we have a conversation about unbelief, express your questions and unbeliefs in a safe space with friends. E- express your questions. Express them, your unbelief, in a safe space with friends. We're at a post-resurrection time uh, when we enter this part of the scripture. But Thomas, one of the twelve called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. The disciples had had an encounter with Jesus after his resurrection at this point. But Thomas was not with them when Jesus came. That's what sets us up in this particular part. Now, who is Thomas? Thomas was one of the 12 disciples that followed closely with Jesus for a three-year period. So when this unfolds, keep in mind that this is a man that was up close, personal, intimate. He hung out with Jesus. He walked the dusty roads with Jesus. He went from city to city with Jesus. He ate with Jesus. He was with Jesus in every imaginable scenario. Didymus uh, is the word for twin. Uh, So Thomas was a twin. Now, I'm not a twin, so I don't understand what it is to be a twin. When I talk to people who are twins, it seems a good portion of the time they're incredibly close. I wonder what that was like to have your twin brother as one of the 12 that were following close into Jesus. Thomas, one of the 12, following Jesus, when we... See other parts of Scripture that talk about Thomas. Um, I think we see an interesting portrayal of him. You've heard the term doubting Thomas. This passage of Scripture we're in right now is where that comes from. This is where we get the idea of doubting Thomas. I think Thomas gets a bad rap. I, I don't think he's quite the doubter that everyone wants to make him out to be. Partly why I think that is in John chapter 11, Jesus gets word that his friend Lazarus has passed away. He's saddened by that, but he delays going to see Lazarus. His disciples are talking to him, and Thomas says in chapter 11, verse 16, he says to his other disciple friends, hey, let's go with him that we might die with him. He he was willing, not too much earlier than what we read here, he was making statements that I am, my loyalty to Jesus is so much that I'm willing to die with him. And he's trying to get the other guys, hey, y'all come on, let's go with him, and I'm willing to die. That, That to me is a man of loyalty And a man of resolve. In John 14, the night before Jesus would be crucified, Jesus is speaking to the disciples and he says, Hey, I'm I'm gonna be going somewhere else. But don't be disheartened by that. So I'm going to prepare a place for you, and you know the way where I'm going. Well, in verse 5 of chapter 14, Thomas is the one that says, we don't know. How do we know the way? That seems like a really good question to me. That's a man who's listening. That's a man who wants to understand. And Jesus gives him a profound answer. If you'll call Jermaine on his cell phone, you'll hear this answer on his voicemail Every time you call, it's been there for years. Jesus said to him, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. Because Thomas asked the question, we have one of the most profound answers of who Jesus is that we could possibly have. In chapter 21, we skipped to there last week because we want to do this message for our students today. But we find Thomas among some of the disciples after this encounter we'll discuss here. And he's waiting for Jesus to come for their next instruction. And then we find him in Acts chapter 1, verse 13. 
And he's in the upper room praying, eagerly waiting for the Holy Spirit to come to be on the mission that God has for him. Now, in between that, he does have some questions, but I don't think it's fair to call him Doubting Thomas. I would say the man had some questions, he had some unbelief creep in, and he was willing to express it. And I love that he gave us a model of what it is to express uh, that kind of, of question. Now then, I would say today, there's a difference in people who are un, in unbelief and really seeking, and those who are in unbelief and they're not interested at all. They're, they're out there. <clears throat> they're out there waiting to be a keyboard warrior uh, and attack you as soon as you say something. They're not interested in anything other than attacking. <clears throat> they're not interested in learning. Not interested in considering an alternate view or growing. For people who are in unbelief and non-seeking, we pray that God will turn their hearts to be genuine seekers of Him. Verse 25, So the other disciples were saying to Him, We've seen the Lord. But He said to them, Unless I see in His hands the imprint of the nails and put my finger into the place of the nails and put my hand into His side, I will not believe. Now, these are his friends. If you went to college or you're in the military and you spent uh, the first few years with a particular unit, or you're in that uh, in college, you meet kind of your good friends right off the bat, and they continue to be your friends, this would be the end of your junior year in college, headed to your senior year. You've spent a lot of time together. You love these guys. You love these girls. You trust them. You've been through a lot with them. You've navigated a, a whole new season of life of independence with them, and here you are, and they're telling you something profound, and you're saying, no, I don't believe it. That's what's happening. These are his friends. He's been with them for three years, and they're saying, we've seen the Lord. We've seen him. And he's saying, no, I don't believe it. And when it says we've seen the Lord, it says they're saying, the idea is they kept telling him this. It wasn't like, hey, we've seen the Lord one time, and they moved on in the dialogue. They're trying to convict. We have seen the Lord. We've seen him. We just saw him. Partly why I wouldn't be so down about Thomas being a doubter is when the women went to the tomb and saw it empty and saw the risen Jesus and they came back and told all the disciples he'd risen. Do you remember their response? Nonsense, they said. So if we want to say doubting Thomas, let's just go ahead and say the doubting 11 because none of them bought into it. At the beginning, they've actually already seen him in 19 through 23. So Jesus said to them, peace be with you as the Father has sent me, I also send you. Prior to that, he said in verse 20, he showed them both his hands and his side. The disciples then rejoiced when they saw the Lord. So Jesus actually showed the disciples his hands and his side. So they've already seen what Thomas is requesting to see. He said, I'm not going to buy it until I see it. You saw it. I'm not buying it until I see it. Now, that's common today, isn't it, for people? If I can't see it, I don't believe it. This speaks to our day. If you're having dialogues with anyone about Jesus, you're running across people who will simply say, I don't believe it. I can't see it. Now, there are a number of things that we experience the benefit of that we can't see, but somehow we believe that. However, this creates a problem for people. I can't see it. Therefore, I don't believe it. Now, a couple of thoughts before I continue. Just because we can't see it or we don't believe it does not mean it's not true. Just because someone doesn't Believe it or can't see it doesn't mean it's not true. And then I'm grateful that God didn't withhold dialogues like this from his word. That we can see 
that he will take on the doubts, the unbelief, and the skepticism of even his own people, his own followers. His, his shoulders are broad enough. God can handle any question we have for him. God can handle any amount of unbelief that we bring to him. We simply want to express our unbelief. In Mark chapter 9, verse 24, a father is it's a son that has been having convulsions, problems. He wants Jesus to heal him. And he says to him, I do believe. Help my unbelief. You ever feel that way? I believe, but I still have unbelief. I believe it, and somewhere this is messing me up a little bit. So it's creating some unbelief. Help me. It's actually belief when we come to God with our unbelief. Now, he's expressing this openly to his friends. He, he's not, he's having trouble. He said, I need to be able to see this or I won't believe. Now, what are some of those things today that people are struggling with that would be unbelief? Can't see it or touch it. That's one of them. What about prayer? I've been praying this. I keep praying it. And for some reason, God's not answering it. So it's really creating some unbelief in me because I'm not seeing this prayer answered. What about the LGBTQ? I thought we were supposed to love everybody. What about race? Why is there so much hatred among people of color? Why across the board do we see different races spewing hatred towards one another? Why is that? Is it true that every person, according to critical race theory, is either an oppressor or the oppressed? Is this true? Is the Bible applicable to social issues? Does this even matter? Does it have anything to say about the issues of the day? What about miracles and the resurrection? Thomas has his questions. Is that a question you have about the resurrection? I like the good morality of Jesus, but I don't know about some of these stories. They're a little much. Not sure I buy those. What about sexual orientation? Gender identity. I mean, really, it, it does just make sense that these would be social constructs that we can make ourselves whatever we would like to be. In a survey of 300 students that a friend of mine did, the biggest one that came back was the problem of evil. If God's a loving God, then why in the world is there all this evil in the world? I mean, that's enough to throw you into a panic, isn't it? There's a number of people asking those questions. Some of those, all of those. Sometimes it can creep in and, and it can create some unbelief inside of us. Like, I, I want to believe this about Jesus, but I don't know that I can these are all real questions. 
in the absolute worst thing that any of us could do as parents, grandparents, life group leaders, pastors, mentors, friends, the worst thing we could do is squelch the questions. It might be your story. You may know somebody's story. They'll tell you they bailed out on the faith when they left high school because they tried to ask questions growing up when they were children, when they were young, and the parents said, we don't ask those questions. You might not have said it, but your nonverbal language said it. And if we can't answer our questions and we start wondering, is this for real? Thomas had enough trust in his friends that he was able to express his doubt and his unbelief to them. Are you a safe space for someone to ask the hard questions. Are we a safe space as a church for someone to ask the hard questions? Will you be willing to ask your questions rather than sit in the unbelief? That's the first piece when we have this conversation. The second part is to allow Jesus to meet you in your specific questions and unbelief. Allow Jesus to meet you. Jesus is very specific in meeting us where we are. He, he doesn't uh, come to someone and say, okay, well, I know you're struggling with this, so I'm going to talk to you about this. Uh, it's not uh, some disconnect there. Jesus meets us where we are uh, if we'll allow him to do so. Uh, and we find that in verses 20. 6 and 27, after eight days, his disciples were again inside, and Thomas with them, and Jesus came, the doors having been shut, and stood in their midst and said, peace be with you. Now, that's what he said when he entered and he saw the disciples uh, in verses 19 through 23. Jesus brings peace. He brings a wholeness uh, to, the, to what's happening. Verse 27. Then he said to Thomas, this is why I say Jesus is specific. <clears throat> reach here with your finger and see my hands. And reach here your hand and put it into my side. And do not be unbelieving, but believing. Thomas said, I'm not buying it until I do this. Jesus said, here you go. This is what you're asking. I'm going to meet you right where you are. It looks like to me that Jesus did not chastise him for asking the question. Jesus didn't make him feel guilty for asking the question. Jesus didn't shame him for asking the question. He didn't say, you've been with me for three years. Come on. He met him right where he was. And then he says, stop becoming an unbeliever and be a believer. There's a place for the questions, but then stop. Stop being an unbeliever and be a believer, Jesus says. Here, reach in. Touch. Stop, stop the unbelief. And believe. Jesus is very specific. That wasn't bad, was it? How does Jesus meet us? I think there are a number of ways that he does. And it's not limited to what I'm about to say. But these are ways. And this is what I would say in some of these things to think about for 
your younger children as you think about a pathway for them. As you think about how you'll help your students as they move out from here to whatever that next phase is. I'm going to start with, you're going to say, well, you're a pastor. Of course you would say that. And I would. At 11 o'clock, when I have 25 seniors in front of me, I'm going to tell them the very first thing you need to do wherever you go is find yourself a church, a Bible-believing, sound-teaching church. You need to make sure with other people that it's a sound, biblical-teaching church. There's a lot of options out there. They're not all good. You want to check around. We can help you. Most of these universities we saw, somebody has a good idea of what great churches are in those college towns, and they're everywhere. Uh, And you want to find one and get involved in one. And you need to do that immediately. That's not further down the road. The longer you wait, the more difficult it gets. Find a church. Lock in. The the kind of people that you meet immediately that you start to hang out with, that'll start to shape you. One of the most crucial decisions that you'll make uh, when you go to college, when you get in the military, is who are you going to hang around? Proverbs 13, 20 says, He who walks with wise men will be wise, but the companion of fools suffers harm. You can either walk with people of wisdom, and wise people are those who fear God and follow God. Foolish people are those who say there is no God or live like there is no God. Now choose who you're going to hang out with. But start. Be under God's word. The scripture. That you're being shaped by the scripture. I started trying to mess around with hours and it, I couldn't get it to work. But I, I thought if you started, let's just say you started at 121 uh, when you were a baby. And we dedicated you and you've run all the way through and now we're sending you out. If you came every Sunday and then starting in middle school, did every Sunday and then Wednesday night, if you did all of that, that's 936 hours that you would have been under some kind of teaching, singing in worship, something of that nature being shaped. That's the equivalent of 162 eight-hour school days. Now, the bulk of how you're being shaped is by something outside of here. So how crucial that you're established in a rhythm of being in the Scripture yourself, day in, day out, that God's Word is rolling and moving through your heart and through your mind. Uh, And then uh, I would say join some kind of an organization that is a Christian-based ministry, something that has Christ-centeredness to us. Both my sons went to Texas A&M, and uh, they were a part of an organization called Bucks, Brothers Under Christ. Uh, and we met, we met the, the neatest young men uh, through that organization. And there are those kinds of organizations on every campus. Anywhere you would go, uh, they're there. And so find something uh, where Christ is the center uh, of, of who that is. And then here's where I would, I would say, I don't know that we all think like this much, but uh, I would consider uh, having a gap year for my student at this point. And uh, we have one of our son's friends that did this, and he went to a place at Pine Cove called The Forge, uh, and it's when you're 21, and you have to map this out, because I know you need to do internships, and I, I know there's all kinds of international abroad, there's all kinds of things that you're supposed to do and need to do, and, and they'll be great to do. I'm trying to map a path where your mind will be Christ-centered and shaped in the midst of all that. Nine months, X number of guys, X number of girls, discipleship community, living together, doing life together, being taught the word together, serving together, on mission together, traveling together. It's a phenomenal opportunity. I would at least tuck that away as something to consider. Think about it for the future. For some, If you're a grandparent, put the money away and say, I'll cover you for those nine months. It'll be the best money you spend uh, on your grandchild to do that. I would say for those who don't yet have kids that are graduating and going out, and you can still do this, actually, if you're a graduate of high school, but I would find a worldview camp to go to and spend a week or two. These are some of the brightest minds that are leading these. 
Uh, and, and I would get inside of that so that I could at least be exposed to some of the best teachers, the best communicators, and some of the brightest students that are getting their faith uh, ingrained in them and know how to respond uh, to the variety of worldviews uh, that are out there. Uh, and then I would say somewhere along the way, uh, I would be a part of spring break missions, summer missions, take a summer and go somewhere else, learn another culture, be in the midst of them, and do it for the name of Christ. Go out as a disciple of Jesus Christ uh, to one of those places, but set the money aside, map a plan for people uh, to be able to do this, and then this coming end of December and January, I would make sure that I did everything I could for my student. Uh, high school senior, anybody in college up to 25 years old, to be at Passion. It's one of the best worship gatherings a student could go to, uh, and I would make sure that they were a part of that, if at all possible. So how do we allow Jesus to meet us? We put ourselves in position for him to meet us. Now, he'll meet us other ways, but there's some things we can do on purpose. These are some of those on-purpose things. I brought several books. You're thinking, wow, that's exciting. Um, But here's what I want our students to know and what I want you to know. I don't care what the issue is out there or what the topic is out there or what the question is out there. There are people, men and women, who have stories, who've written, studied in depth, There are resources. Could I just ask you to always consider there's another alternative uh, if you're getting challenged in your Christian faith? There is a Christian response to it. You run into skeptics, Timothy Keller, The Reason for God, one of the best books written for the... There's a number of resources, by the way. These are just some. Uh, The Reason for God, outstanding. Uh, The LGBTQ issue... Uh, And what's going on there, Caleb Kaltenbach, his book, Messy Grace. Uh, His mom uh, was lesbian, his dad was gay. Uh, He today is a Christian pastor, and he just writes that experience of how uh, he's walked through that. It's incredible, biblically sound, uh, real-life story of how he's walked through that. Rosaria Butterfield, The Secret Thoughts of an Unlikely Convert. She was a Syracuse professor in the 90s, a leading activist uh, in the lesbian community, uh, and yet and then God came and met her. Uh, her website, by the way, uh, I looked at it this week for the first time, phenomenal on questions around LGBTQ. I didn't know that she had that out there. Uh, in, incredible responses to the common questions of today. Uh, out of a Far Country by Christopher uh, Yuan. It's a gay son's journey to God, a broken mother's search for hope. Uh, phenomenal story. Christopher Yuan's one of the... Uh, Most prominent guys out there speaking uh, on this issue. Sean McDowell and his dad, Josh McDowell. This book, Evidence That Demands a Verdict. Hey, we don't need to be afraid of substantive stuff. Uh, It's okay to get big, thick books uh, and to pour over them uh, so that we can have really great responses to what's going on in our culture. And this is what I would say to our students uh, today. And this is what I would say to anybody that has a student If you're just looking for one thing, like all this is a little overwhelming, I intended for it to be because I want you to see there's plenty out there to answer the questions. It's safe to ask them. There's plenty to answer them. But if I was going to track anybody as a college student right now to be a help to me, uh, he's on TikTok, Twitter, Snapchat. I would follow Sean McDowell. I noticed one of our students is going to Biola University. He's a professor at Biola Uh, He teaches a high school senior class uh, so he can stay relevant to what's going on in that generation. His son just recently told him that if he didn't get on TikTok, he would totally miss what's going on in the next generation. He's active out on TikTok. Uh, He does these two-minute videos on issues, but incredibly well-rounded on any issue that's going on. He speaks to them. A number of people do. I think he's incredibly relevant to our college students and our students, thus incredibly relevant Uh, to us. The Third Option by Miles McPherson, great book on race, Mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis, uh, The Transgender's Faith by Walt Heyer, phenomenal story, Uh, Live Not by Lies, A Manual for Christian Dissidents by Rod Dreyer, 
excellent book on helping us understand what's happening in the culture today, along with The Practical Guide to Culture uh, by John Stone Street. That was fast. I know that. I just want you to know uh, God has given very gifted people minds to write and to help us navigate through unbelief. And Jesus meets us sometimes through books. Openly express, allow Jesus to meet you, and then know that the most freeing response to Jesus is belief. Freedom comes at the place of belief. Verse 28, Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God. What a powerful declaration And it's one of the strongest statements we have in Scripture of the deity of Jesus Christ. He went from, I don't believe it. I'm not going to believe it until I can reach in and touch. He didn't reach in and touch. In the presence of Jesus, all he could do was say, my Lord. And my God, I've found that to be the case over the years. That people who have all these questions, that if I can just lay out the gospel and the good news of Jesus, the questions move over to the side. When we get enamored with Jesus, the questions aren't so much a stumbling block anymore. There's something to be pursued. We need to understand. We want to be able to help. And my prayer is that we have a number of students that will be the ones helping people in unbelief. And we have some that will need help. It's both. Some of us need help in unbelief, and some of us can help others in unbelief. Some of us can help in one area, and somebody else can help us in the area where we have unbelief. But at the center of it all, that just kind of makes all of this just sort of, uh, er- everything just kind of go to the side. It really is Jesus. Amen. And Thomas is just sitting there in the presence of Jesus, and he's saying, I'm not believing this until I do this. And Jesus comes, he meets him right there. I'll let you do it. But he doesn't need to. Because God has gifted him with the grace and the eyes to see who he is. Is that your declaration today? It's okay to have questions. But when you look at Jesus Christ and what he did, crucified and risen, do you look at him and say, my God and my Lord, that's all I can do? Not this past Wednesday, but the previous Wednesday through Sunday, three different people made this declaration. Yeah, it's awesome. One lady in our church, and she's in this service, her mom was here visiting from the Northeast. Her mom wanted to meet, so we met together, and we walked through a few things, but one of the ways that I just showed her, and this was a whole lot more detail, I'll just give you a little brief picture, I said, hey, here's where where every person starts, looks like on this is a mountain, use your imagination, Uh, And here's this gap between the mountains. And let's just um, imagine God is on this mountain. And and that's really our predicament. Is that this is the problem. Brandon Smeltzer said it. Here's the problem. We're we're sinful and separated from God. And and here God is. And here's the solution. It's what Jesus Christ did on the cross. And taking our sins on himself. And. I wish you could have seen her face. She got so excited when she saw me draw that. And then she said, who wouldn't believe that? 
I said, do you believe it? She said, I do. We're done. I didn't get to finish my presentation that I had in my head I wanted to share. There was no need. She believed it. We didn't stop and say a sinner's prayer. She believed it. That's it. She's in. On Sunday morning, Jessica told me that a lady who attended the retreat, she was talking to her, and she was talking about having given her life to Jesus. And Jessica said, do you mean at the ladies' retreat? What are, she said, yes, last night between 5.15 and 6 o'clock. I got home, and as she was processing what she heard, God reached in and rescued her. By the way, I love how somebody said it. We're not inviting Jesus into our life. God's inviting us into his life. We're receiving the invitation. What a beautiful gift that he would do that. My Lord, my God, yes, there will be questions. Express them openly. Get them out there. Wrestle through them. Bring the hardest ones you've got. If we don't know the answer, we're going to find somebody who does. We're going to dig in the scriptures till we find it. But man, the freedom comes when we believe. Our prayer is that God will just remove any hardness of heart, any skepticism, any questions that are preventing belief. Open eyes wide to see him. That's why John wrote this book. He says in verse 31, he wrote it so that we might believe and have eternal life. That's my prayer for our students. And that there'll be ones who turn around and lead others to do the same. I started by saying, I want our students to be like Thomas. Do you understand why I want them to be like him? I'd like for us all to be like Thomas. My Lord and my God. And we are, by the way, verse 29, because you have seen me, have you believed? Blessed are they who did not see and yet believe. Any of us who believe, we're verse 29. We didn't get to see him physically. By faith, we believe. And life's never been the same. Father, thank you for our time uh, and be strengthened in your word today. And uh, God, thank you for the power uh, and the, the, uh, of the scripture and for making yourself known through it. Lord, I know that the majority of us probably have, have questions, and we have moments of unbelief, and will you help us be like that dad, uh, and we believe, help our unbelief. Will you meet each person wherever those unbeliefs are today and in the future? Will you help us be a part of being a freeing space where someone can ask the questions and know it's safe? And will you give us courage to ask the ones that we have? And will you open our hearts and minds to where we can make the same declaration as Thomas, my Lord and my God, and that we would follow you with everything that we have, with the deepest loyalty and resolve, wrapped in your grace and in your mercy, motivated by the love of Christ and empowered by the Holy Spirit. And it's in that name of Jesus that I pray. I don't know what God is saying to you or not saying to you this morning, but let's just take this a little bit of a space and um, allow that to be um, anchored in. Um, whatever that might be.